Welcome everyone to our presentation on the Riemann hypothesis. Today, we will explore some of the most fascinating aspects of number theory and delve into one of its most enduring mysteries. Euler's initial work. We begin with the remarkable contributions of Leonhard Euler. In the 18th century, Euler made groundbreaking discoveries in understanding infinite series. He introduced the idea that the harmonic series, which is the sum of the reciprocals of the positive integers, could be expressed as a product over prime numbers. This was a revolutionary insight, as it linked the seemingly simple harmonic series to the complex and profound properties of prime numbers. Euler's formula was one of the first indications of the deep connections between primes and series. Basel Problem Solution Euler didn't stop there. He also tackled the Basel problem, which was concerned with finding the exact sum of the reciprocals of the squares of the integers. By examining the sine function and its product representation, Euler derived a formula for this sum. He showed that the sum of these reciprocals is equal to pi caret 2 6. This result was a significant achievement in mathematics and highlighted Euler's ability to uncover connections between different mathematical concepts. Riemann's analytical machinery. Moving to the 19th century, we encounter Bernard Riemann, who expanded our understanding of complex functions. Riemann introduced the concept of analytical continuation, which allowed for the extension of functions beyond their initial domains. For example, he extended the Riemann zeta function, which was initially defined only for complex numbers with real parts greater than 1, to the entire complex plane except for s equals 1, where it has a simple pole. This was a crucial advancement in complex analysis and paved the way for deeper exploration of functions. Riemann zeta function. The Riemann zeta function is central to our discussion. For values of s with real parts greater than 1, it is defined as the sum of the reciprocals of integer powers. Riemann's extension of this function to all complex numbers except s equals 1 revealed new dimensions of mathematical exploration. The zeta function became a key object of study in number theory and complex analysis, connecting various areas of mathematics. Dirichlet eta function. Riemann was also influenced by the Dirichlet eta function, defined by an alternating series. This function is closely related to the zeta function and provides valuable insights into its behavior, particularly for values of s less than 1. The relationship between the eta function and the zeta function is encapsulated in a simple formula involving the gamma function and powers of 2, which helps in understanding the zeta function's properties across different regions. Reflection properties. One of Riemann's major discoveries was the reflection formula for the zeta function. This formula demonstrates a symmetry between the values of the zeta function at s and 1 minus s. Specifically, it shows that zeta, 1 minus s, can be expressed in terms of zetas using factors involving pi, the gamma function, and trigonometric functions. This reflection formula is fundamental to the theory of the zeta function and provides deep insights into its structure. Jacobi theta function. Riemann also made use of the Jacobi theta function, which has significant applications in various areas of mathematics. The theta function's series representation and modular properties were instrumental in Riemann's derivation of the functional equation for the zeta function. This equation is crucial for understanding the zeta function's behavior across the complex plane and highlights its intricate connections to other mathematical functions. Functional equation of the zeta function. The functional equation of the zeta function relates its values at s and 1 minus s through a complex expression involving pi, the gamma function, and trigonometric functions. This equation is a key result in the theory of the zeta function, showcasing its symmetry and the deep relationships between different mathematical concepts. Riemann's seminal paper. In 1859, Riemann published his seminal paper on the distribution of prime numbers, which introduced the zeta function and laid the groundwork for modern analytic number theory. This paper was a milestone in mathematical history and has had a lasting impact on the field, influencing subsequent research and discoveries. Riemann's hypothesis. Finally, we address the Riemann hypothesis itself. Riemann proposed that all non-trivial zeros of the zeta function lie on the critical line where the real part of s is half. This hypothesis has profound implications for number theory, particularly in understanding the distribution of prime numbers. Despite extensive numerical evidence supporting the hypothesis, a formal proof or disproof remains one of the greatest challenges in mathematics. 
Let's start with the unit cycle. We have unit circle centered at the origin with key points and arcs marked every pi 3 or pi 6 radians. Let's explore the significance of these pi 3 or pi 6 angles. The unit circle is a fundamental concept in mathematics, especially in complex analysis and trigonometry. Here, we've divided the circle into six equal parts, each corresponding to pi 3 or pi 6 radians, or 60 degrees, because sine and cosines are intricately connected pi 6 radians, or 30 degrees also comes into action. This division highlights the symmetry and periodicity inherent in circular functions. Specialty of pi 3 or pi 6 angles. These pi 3 or pi 6 angles are particularly noteworthy in the context of the Riemann hypothesis. The Riemann hypothesis concerns the Riemann zeta function and its zeros. According to the hypothesis, all non-trivial zeros of the zeta function lie on the critical line where the real part of S is half. If we project these angles onto the complex plane, the unit circle intersects the critical line at specific points. These intersections correspond to the pi 3 or pi 6 intervals, which represent key angles where the circle aligns with the critical line. This alignment is significant because it illustrates the relationship between geometric angles and the behavior of complex functions, especially in relation to the distribution of zeros. In this context, the pi 3 or pi 6 angles serve as a bridge between the geometric representation of the unit circle and the analytical properties of the Riemann zeta function. They emphasize how fundamental concepts in geometry and trigonometry intersect with deeper questions in number theory and complex analysis. Intuition and examples. To build some intuition, let's consider a simple example. Take any odd number on your calculator and divide it by 2. You'll get another decimal number, typically a non-recurring decimal, representing half of the original. This process is straightforward and trivial, but it highlights the special nature of dividing by 2. Geometrically you can visualize this as our good old pi 2 orthogonal representation. Now, let's try something different. Take a sufficiently large number, calculate its logarithm, and then divide the result by the logarithm of 2. You'll notice that you don't end up in a repeating decimal loop. Instead, you get a value that eventually resolves to zero, although the length of the decimal part may vary. This non-repeating property reflects a more profound mathematical behavior. You might think, zeta zeros are different, and you're correct but trust me all are connected at some point of time. For now let's appreciate the midpoint, half, as a unique equidistant position as the building blocks of plus one progression among the number line. Geometrically, these pi 3 or pi 6 slices of the unit circle emphasize this midpoint's importance. You may ask again, why not pi 2, the gradient one line, then I say yes, the top view will look like pi 2, but beneath it there are more structures. The structure we see here in simple divisions and logarithms also underpins the complex and intricate nature of zeta zeros. Interactive mystery. Now, let's create more suspense and mystery. I'd like everyone to take out their calculators for a moment. Please take the reciprocal of Euler's number e and add to it the double natural logarithm of 2. What result do you get? You should see that the result is 0 up to 2 decimal points. Does anyone have any idea why this happens? In case you missed it, let's repeat the process. Take the reciprocal of Euler's number e and add to it the double natural logarithm of 2. The result is 0 up to 2 decimal points. This intriguing result hints at the deep connections and symmetries in mathematics. Some of you may say, poor boy, 2 decimal places are not enough. To those skeptics, consider this, 2 leading decimal places are indeed significant. In scientific measurements, having two decimal places can be enough to disrupt a five sigma accuracy, which is often used to assert a discovery in physics. The fact that this result zeroes out at two leading decimal places is not just a coincidence. It points to deeper, underlying symmetries and relationships in mathematics, much like those proposed by the Riemann hypothesis. The Riemann hypothesis itself deals with the precise and delicate placement of zeros of the zeta function along the critical line. This phenomenon we've explored here with e and log 2 is a small but tantalizing glimpse into the kind of intricate, beautiful truths that the Riemann hypothesis seeks to uncover. While we have entered the domain of physics, let's talk about dark energy. Although its exact percentage keeps fluctuating, as of 2023, it was estimated to be around 69%.
Recently, data from the James Webb Space Telescope is suggesting this value might be adjusted downward again. But has anyone ever wondered why this percentage is astonishingly close to the natural logarithm of 2? This seemingly trivial coincidence adds another layer of mystery to our understanding of the universe. Could it be a mere coincidence, or is there a deeper, hidden connection between the fundamental constants of mathematics and the fabric of our cosmos? The proximity of these values invites us to ponder the profound links between mathematical truths and physical reality, much like the mysteries posed by the Riemann hypothesis. Not only that, but magically, the Hubble constant, despite having an altogether different unit of measurement, also seems to want to settle around the value 69. This consistency is intriguing. But why does this value, measured in kilometers per second per megaparsec, keep hovering around 100 times the natural logarithm of 2? Does anyone have any idea why the unit kilometer second megaparsec cannot get rid of multiples of 100 times line 2? Thanks to our ancestors for choosing a metric system very close to reality. It was their countless night observations of the sky and their handwritten almanac of ephemeris data we are experimentally confirming today. Don't avoid these questions. They are crucial for understanding the deeper mathematical structures that underlie the Riemann hypothesis. The consistency of these values across different domains suggests there might be more profound, hidden connections waiting to be uncovered. I am not undermining any country, continents, or its contribution. By ancestors, specifically, I meant ancestors of the Indian subcontinent, where the decimal system took birth, flourished, and spread to other parts of the world. Did you know that the Leibniz series for Pi was actually discovered by the Indian mathematician Madhava of Sangamagrama? Aryabhata provided a significantly accurate value of Pi long before Archimedes. The same Aryabhata had insights into gravity long before Newton. Long before Pythagoras, Bodhiana had written about the same Pythagorean theorem in a little poetic style verses. Infinite series and calculus were used in ancient India well before their formal development in Europe. The concept of the relativity of time was known to Indians since antiquity, as described in ancient texts. The Indian subcontinent has a rich history of mathematical and scientific advancements. These ancient scholars laid down the foundations for many concepts that we use today. Their work demonstrates the deep mathematical understanding that existed long before these ideas were discovered or formalized elsewhere. These connections and the long history of mathematical thought are crucial for understanding the Riemann hypothesis and other profound questions in mathematics. Thank you for your attention, and let's continue to explore these historical insights and their impact on modern science. Why am I telling all this? What does it have to do with the Riemann hypothesis? Am I going to say the Riemann hypothesis was known by Indian ancestors? My answer will be yes, they could have, because they used it. Not only Indians, even the Greeks had insights into complex mathematical systems as evidenced by the mysterious Antikythera mechanism, which had an intricate 19 times 53 gear-like system. You must be saying, what? Are you insane? Unfortunately not, because of the colonial system, I was educated through the Macaulay curriculum. Like many others, I was also deprived of this rich ancient knowledge but once I started reconnecting it did not took much time to achieve a steep learning curve ratio and connect the dots. Let me tell you they these Greek fellows were actually trying to follow a 1000 year bigger cycle in which Indians already graduated and mastered by calculating million, billion, trillion year cycles. Indians used 14 and 71 as the multiplier as they keep on calculating the age of the Indian trinity gods. The absolute male energy named Purusha and the absolute female energy named Prakriti remained eternal searching for the eternal knowledge known as Brahman. Can you track their use of LN2? For more readings you are requested to read Carl Sagan or refer Wikipedia on Hindu concepts of time. Noteworthy to mention that there are similar verses in the Quran saying, and indeed, a day with your Lord is like a thousand years of those which you count. And in the internet, you will find number crunches like me, calculating the speed of light out of this verse. So I am not alone to blame. Understanding the deep connections and the advanced mathematical and scientific knowledge of ancient civilizations can give us new insights into modern problems. The Riemann hypothesis, with its profound implications and mysterious nature, might be more connected to ancient knowledge than we currently realize. You might have heard the story of the young Carl Friedrich Gauss, who, when asked to sum the first 100 numbers, gave the correct answer in just seconds. 
Today, this calculation can be done quickly by anyone, but at that time, it was thought to be an act of genius. Remember this boy, Gauss, who was playing with prime numbers and went on to come up with the prime number theorem, PNT. The theorem describes the asymptotic distribution of prime numbers and was a major milestone in number theory. Gauss's work laid the groundwork for many important mathematical discoveries, including the Riemann hypothesis. His genius in recognizing patterns and making profound mathematical insights continues to inspire mathematicians to this day. Did anybody do the mental math? The sum of the first 100 numbers is 50-50. Notice that it simplifies to 50-50. What does this have to do with the Riemann hypothesis? It's interesting to see that the sum breaks down to 50 and 50. This represents a halfway mark, not just once, but twice. It's a reminder to open your mind to strange and unexpected connections. Before we dive into the details, consider this peculiar alignment. It might not be a coincidence. The way numbers and their sums reveal patterns can often lead to deeper mathematical insights, including those related to the Riemann hypothesis. Thank you for your attention, and let's keep this intriguing connection in mind as we continue exploring the mysteries of mathematics. The Greeks followed a 19-year to 20-year cycle combined with a 53-year to 50-year cycle in their Antikythera mechanism. This ancient Greek device, often referred to as the world's first analog computer, was used for studying the night sky and tracking celestial events. The 19-year metonic cycle was crucial for understanding the relationship between the solar year and the lunar months, helping predict eclipses and alignments. The 20-year calypic cycle was an improvement over the metonic cycle, providing a more accurate alignment of the lunar calendar with the solar year. Additionally, the Greeks incorporated a 53-year cycle into their calculations to synchronize the lunar months with the seasons, and a 50-year cycle must have arise naturally to balance the calypic cycle corrections. This sophisticated mechanism was used to predict the timing of solar and lunar eclipses, the phases of the moon, and the timing of the Olympic Games, reflecting the Greeks' deep understanding of celestial mechanics. It also played a role in agriculture, helping determine the best times for planting and harvesting based on the cycles of the moon and the sun. The precision of the Antikythera mechanism underscores the advanced level of astronomical and mathematical knowledge in ancient Greece, revealing a complex understanding of cycles and patterns that were vital for both scientific and practical purposes. This ancient device highlights how early civilizations used mathematical cycles to understand and predict the natural world, echoing the kinds of deep mathematical insights that we still explore today, including those related to the Riemann hypothesis. In ancient Indian cosmology, numbers 71 and 14 hold significant importance in calculating the ages of Brahma and the demigods. According to Hindu scriptures, a single day of Brahma, known as a Kalpa, is composed of 14 Manvantaras. Each Manvantara lasts for 71 Mahayugas, which are cycles consisting of four Yugas, Sacha Yuga, Treta Yuga, Vipara Yuga, and Kali Yuga. Therefore, one Kalpa, or one day of Brahma, equals 14 Manvantaras, and each Manvantara contains 71 Mahayugas. This intricate system of time calculation reflects the profound understanding and conceptualization of time in ancient Indian culture. To put it in perspective, the lifespan of Brahma is said to be 100 years, where each year consists of 360 days of Brahma. This translates into vast periods that are almost unimaginable, demonstrating the Indian sages' deep insights into the cyclical nature of the universe. These calculations not only highlight the advanced nature of ancient Indian cosmology but also show the incredible depth of their temporal frameworks that continue to fascinate scholars and enthusiasts around the world. Thank you for your attention, and let's continue to explore these fascinating connections between ancient knowledge and modern mathematical mysteries. What else did the Indians achieve in the realm of astronomy? Aryabhata, in his seminal work Aryabhatiya, made remarkable contributions. He provided accurate descriptions of planetary movements, the length of a year, and the concept of sidereal years. Aryabhata's calculations included the rotation period of the Earth, the duration of a solar year, and the positions of planets with impressive accuracy for his time. His work laid the foundation for a sophisticated almanac or ephemeris that has stood the test of time. In addition to Aryabhata, the Indian astronomers developed detailed astronomical tables and methods for predicting celestial events. The Suya Siddhanta, another crucial text, includes precise calculations for planetary positions, eclipses, and other astronomical phenomena. 
It describes the cycle of the moon, planetary motions, and the various epochs used in Indian astronomy. The accuracy of these early Indian astronomical records is astonishing. They not only provided practical tools for agriculture and timekeeping but also contributed to a deeper understanding of the cosmos. These ancient Indian techniques were so accurate that they are still referenced and hold up well against modern astronomical observations. The depth of knowledge and precision achieved by ancient Indian astronomers underscores their advanced understanding of celestial mechanics, reflecting a rich tradition of mathematical and scientific inquiry that parallels many of the profound questions we explore today, including those related to the Riemann hypothesis. Thank you for your attention, and let's continue to delve into these historical achievements and their impact on our understanding of the universe. Before we dive into another suspenseful topic, let's take a quick flashback to John Napier, the mathematician who introduced logarithms. Napier's invention of logarithms was a groundbreaking development in mathematics. He created logarithm tables and a logarithm wheel, tools that revolutionized calculations by transforming multiplication and division into addition and subtraction. Interestingly, these tools were used widely without a deep understanding of their underlying principles. The practical utility of logarithms was clear, but the deeper mathematical mechanisms behind them were not fully grasped at the time. This brings us to Jacob Bernoulli, who made significant contributions to the concept of limits associated with it. Bernoulli first observed the limit in the context of compound interest. He examined how interest compounding continuously leads to a limit, which was later formalized as Euler's number E. Bernoulli's insight into this limit was crucial for understanding continuous growth and decay. Euler's number E, approximately 2.71828, is the base of natural logarithms and plays a fundamental role in mathematics. Euler expanded on Bernoulli's findings, exploring the properties of E and its connection to the exponential function and calculus. Now, I present to you another intriguing limit in the form of ln2, which can help mathematicians introduce and understand algebraic cycles. This concept is central to the famous Hodge conjecture, a profound and still unproven conjecture in mathematics that deals with the relationship between algebraic cycles and the topology of algebraic varieties. The idea of algebraic cycles explores how certain geometric and algebraic structures can be described through cycles in a higher dimensional space. While the Hodge conjecture remains unproven, it reflects a deep and important area of research in mathematics, offering insights into the structure and properties of complex spaces. Don't be ashamed of exploring cycles and patterns. Antiquity and modernity both reveal that such cycles are not just theoretical constructs but have real implications and applications. For example, consider Roger Penrose's interest in the cyclic universe model. Penrose has explored how the universe might undergo an eternal cycle of expansion and contraction. His study of polarization in the cosmic microwave background, CMB, has fueled this fascinating idea, showing that cycles and patterns in cosmology can offer insights into the nature of the universe itself. The study of cycles, whether in algebraic geometry or cosmology, connects mathematical theory with physical reality, revealing a tapestry of patterns that span both ancient and contemporary research. These cycles are real, and understanding them can provide a deeper appreciation of the fundamental structures governing our universe. Thank you for your attention, and let's continue to explore these captivating connections and their implications for both mathematics and science. How many of you believe that God or Allah created this universe in six days and on the seventh day said, let there be light and there was light? Without challenging or undermining your belief system, have you ever wondered where the number seven came from? After all, without clocks, every day seems just like yet another day. I don't know anything about the book of Genesis but from a clock's perspective the concept of seven days actually has historical roots that trace back to ancient astronomical knowledge. The idea of a seven-day week has its origins in the Suya Siddhanta, an ancient Indian astronomical text. The Suya Siddhanta describes a sophisticated understanding of planetary motions and celestial cycles, which included a seven-day cycle that influenced various cultural and religious practices. The ancient Indian system eventually spread and influenced other cultures, becoming an integral part of timekeeping and calendar systems. The seven-day week later took formal shape in the development of clocks and calendars, which structured time and daily life in numerous societies around the world. The Indian concepts of time were so profound that they inspired the renowned astrophysicist Carl Sagan. 
In his book Cosmos, Sagan marvels at the ancient Indian understanding of vast time scales, which are remarkably similar to modern scientific views. The Hindu cosmological timeline describes cycles of creation and destruction, known as yugas, each lasting millions of years. This concept of cyclic time, with its immense duration, far exceeds the historically linear time frame seen in other ancient cultures. Sagan was particularly fascinated by the Hindu idea that the universe undergoes an infinite number of deaths and rebirths, much like modern theories about the cyclical nature of the cosmos, such as the Big Bang and Big Crunch theories. He also noted the correlation between the age of the universe as described in Hindu texts and the scientific estimation of the age of the universe. In addition to Sagan, these Indian concepts of time have influenced many scholars and scientists, illustrating how ancient wisdom can resonate with contemporary scientific understanding. The intricate and advanced nature of Indian cosmology continues to be a subject of study and admiration in the fields of astronomy and physics. The historical link between the ancient astronomical systems and the concept of a seven-day week shows how deeply ingrained and influential these early astronomical insights were. They provided a framework that has persisted through centuries, shaping our understanding of time and our daily routines. Thank you for your attention, and let's appreciate how historical knowledge and cultural practices intertwine to form the concepts we live by today. All this was to induct you into the concept of natural cycles, preparing you for a quantum leap in understanding, much like the electrons that make sudden transitions in quantum systems. In the past, I have been trolled and compared with Terence Howard. I didn't know him until I came across some YouTube comments when searched about him I came to know about his square root of two loop from YouTube. By the way, Howard's problem is also related to the Riemann hypothesis, but his claim that 1 times 1 is equal to 2 might not be the correct interpretation. If you want to rank crackbots by their claims, then please rank me the first as along with my claims I place my proofs of equations too. I invite you to explore more structures and concepts, which I am happy to share freely, provided you show a genuine interest in understanding cycles. The mathematical world is rich with insights and patterns that extend beyond initial impressions. Engaging with these cycles can lead to profound discoveries and a deeper appreciation of the interconnected nature of mathematical ideas. Thank you for your attention, and let's continue to explore these fascinating concepts and their implications for our understanding of the universe. The connection between Napier's logarithms, Bernoulli's limit, and Euler's number e illustrates how mathematical concepts evolve and interconnect. These innovations highlight the deep interplay between logarithms, limits, and continuous growth, paving the way for more profound discoveries, including those related to the Riemann hypothesis. Where did I get these cyclic ideas in algebra? They have been present in geometry all along. Growing up with Hindu beliefs, cyclic notion was embedded in my very being. However, the concrete idea for these cycles in a mathematical context came from a mighty Caltech open course where, specifically Richard Feynman's lecture on algebra chapter logarithms. In his lecture, Feynman explained how to build a logarithm table just from the knowledge of square root, assuming no pre-existing tables. During this process, he derived the base, 10 logarithm of 3.16228, which is very close to 0.5. Notice the cycle here, 3.16228 is approximately pi again, revealing how cyclic patterns emerge in mathematics. This connection highlights how the number 3.16228 approximates pi, showing an inherent cyclic relationship. I am not bluffing, go and check it for yourself. I checked it just last night also, still it exists. If Feynman had pursued number theory with the same zeal, he might have tackled the Riemann hypothesis. His work on path integrals and Feynman diagrams demonstrate his unification skills. Yes, I knew you might argue that 3.16228 is an approximation rather than exact pi. But consider this, can you bring me equal to absolute zero first? Even the cosmic microwave background, CMB, has a temperature close to 2.7 Kelvin, can you see Euler number in the CMB temperature? You will see 100 multiple of Euler number in Charles constant, 10 multiple of Euler number in lunar cycle and a female's menstruation cycle, maybe that's why females are called moonborn. Please don't make any other meaning out of it, it is just natural for females to bleed for 3 to 4 days after every 27 days to keep the internal reproductive cycle aligned to the natural cycle. What is a male cycle? There are male cycles too, Google it you will come to know. 
men or women both follow 69 to 72 heartbeats per minute. Can you see LN2 in your heartbeats? I can guess whole lot hateful comments waiting for me. I gave you my intuition of completing a cycle through LN2, which is also very close to the inverse of Euler's number E. I know many of you are trying to judge me as a numerologist, but believe me, I had to study math very hard from all the open courseware, surf through Wikipedia offline zim dumps as well as YouTube videos from various math channels, learn latex and learn macros to write my paper. My latex writing was classified as non-standard. I've faced comments like, I don't know anything about math. No one ever told me that I cannot try anything new directly, yet diplomatically they felt me that way. I've received comments from seasoned mathematicians saying it's actually very hard to find something new in mathematics. I can understand their philosophy. But when it comes to writing a math paper you will find yourself totally blank in expressing your thoughts, yet we complete our projects, a thesis submitted and forget it. There remain many lines we write which were not written by anybody in the past. Those lines are rediscovered again by somebody else. Now we can treat them as old, but the person who originally wrote those lines often gets lost in the math archives. In the rarest of rare cases, the new discoverer acknowledges the original credit. Before we try Riemann hypothesis, my suggestion would be, we should start low with Gödel's depression, then conquer it with Eminothus intelligence, we will need conservation of two fundamental laws of algebra as well as numerical arithmetic, and finally we should try for the enlightenment in the path of Riemann's hypothesis. Gödel's incompleteness theorem has a profound impact on our understanding of mathematics. It states that in any consistent axiomatic system that is capable of expressing basic arithmetic, there are true statements that cannot be proven within that system. This result implies that no matter how many axioms we add to our mathematical framework, there will always be some truths that elude formal proof. Given this, one might question whether mathematics can ever be made complete. Gödel's work suggests that the answer is no. The incompleteness is an inherent feature of any sufficiently powerful system of axioms. However, this does not mean that our mathematical efforts are futile. On the contrary, adding new axioms can significantly enrich mathematics, allowing us to explore and understand more complex structures and phenomena. The pursuit of new axioms is a crucial aspect of mathematical progress. By incorporating new axioms, we can develop new theories and solve problems that were previously unsolvable. This ongoing process reflects the dynamic and evolving nature of mathematics, where each new discovery opens up further questions and avenues for exploration. Mathematics is the language of the universe, describing everything from the tiniest particles to the vastness of space. Completion of mathematical journey will perhaps end where we started, i.e. the numbers, particularly the real numbers. As promised, after getting depressed knowing Gödel's work, it's time for getting out of it. To start with let me ask you a question. We have got completely ordered set of real numbers, then why Gödel had to come with his incompleteness? The answer is we were not happy, we needed more structures to answer more question. More structures brought more questions, some of which remained incomplete. Now if we adopt shut up and calculate approach then we will be restoring the pre-existing order in our mathematics. This will be cheating on there are true statements that cannot be proven within that system. No, we are not cheating here. We should read it like there are true statements that cannot be proven within that system except those true statements which required no proof at the first place. zermelo frankel set theory start with a null set and keep on building more sets as the number of elements increases. Notable to see is even a null set gets a count, something out of nothing. Philosophically, zero represents the concept of nothingness, the absence of any quantity. This idea is deeply intertwined with existential and metaphysical inquiries into the nature of reality, existence, and the universe. Zero is unique in that it bridges the finite and the infinite, the tangible and the abstract. We will not discuss it further as zermelo frankel set theory was not my original inspiration and I am not sure whether it can deliver the proof of Riemann hypothesis. My original inspiration was symmetry, we will be moving towards that direction. In algebra, symmetries and inverses are fundamental concepts that permeate various mathematical structures. Understanding the deep connections between symmetries, additive inverses, multiplicative inverses, and zero division can provide insights into the elegant harmony underlying algebraic systems. 
Symmetry in mathematics refers to a property where a structure remains unchanged under certain transformations. Symmetries can manifest in many forms, such as geometric symmetries, like rotations and reflections, and algebraic symmetries, like permutation of elements in a set. In algebra, symmetries often relate to operations that can be performed on elements of a set without altering the underlying structure of the set. For example, the set of real numbers is symmetric under addition and multiplication. These symmetries are described by the existence of additive and multiplicative inverses. The additive inverse of a number is another number such that their sum is zero, the additive identity. The concept of additive inverse is deeply connected to the symmetry of the number line. For any point on the number line, negative of that point is symmetrically opposite with respect to the origin zero. This symmetry ensures that every number has a counterpart that undoes the addition of the original number, leading to the neutral element zero. Similarly, the multiplicative inverse, or reciprocal, of a nonzero number is another number such that their product is one, the multiplicative identity. The multiplicative inverse represents a symmetry in the context of scaling transformations. For any nonzero number the reciprocal is the scaling factor that undoes the multiplication by bringing the product back to the neutral element, 1. Algebraic structures like groups, rings, and fields encapsulate these symmetries and inverses in a formal framework. A group is a set equipped with a single binary operation that satisfies closure, associativity, the existence of an identity element, and the existence of inverses. The symmetries in a group are described by the existence of inverses and the identity element, ensuring that every element has an undoing counterpart. A ring extends the concept of a group by incorporating two binary operations, usually addition and multiplication. Rings also respect the distributive property. The symmetries in a ring are more complex, involving both additive and multiplicative inverses, though the multiplicative inverses might not exist for all elements. A field is a ring in which every nonzero element has a multiplicative inverse. Fields exhibit the highest level of symmetry as they support both additive and multiplicative inverses for all elements except zero in the case of multiplication. The deep connection between symmetries and inverses in algebra lies in the ability to undo operations and return to a neutral state, whether through addition or multiplication or both together. Additive inverses reflect the symmetry around zero, while multiplicative inverses reflect the symmetry around one. All of my work on Riemann hypothesis is centered around symmetry. Now let's move to the key concepts in my work. The first key concept in this paper is the dual unit circle which is based on symmetry. Similar to how an electron can exist in multiple states simultaneously until it is measured, the dual unit circle coexists alongside the unit circle. This concept extends the familiar unit circle from complex analysis, where Euler's unit circle is defined in the complex plane and is key to understanding the relationships between trigonometric functions and complex exponentials. Complex numbers, despite obeying all the fundamental laws of algebra, cannot be ordered in a manner consistent with their algebraic properties. This stems from the fact that any ordered field must allow for a comparison of every pair of elements. No consistent ordering of complex numbers is possible, as it would violate fundamental properties of the field. When we extend our number system to higher dimensions, such as with quaternions and actonians, the concept of ordering becomes even more complex. Quaternions, discovered by William Rowan Hamilton, extend complex numbers to four dimensions. The multiplication of quaternions is non-commutative. Just as with complex numbers, if we attempt to order quaternions, we encounter contradictions. Actonians extend quaternions to eight dimensions and are even more complex. Actonians are non-associative as well as non-commutative. The non-associativity and non-commutativity of actonians further complicate any notion of ordering. Complex numbers, quaternions, and actonians are essential in various fields of mathematics and physics, providing powerful tools for describing rotations, transformations, and other phenomena. However, their algebraic structures inherently lack a consistent ordering compatible with the field properties. This highlights a fundamental difference between these high-dimensional number systems and the real numbers, where a linear order is naturally defined. The dual unit circle introduces us to a high-dimensional space, adding complexity and new possibilities. 
Here, quaternions, actonians, sardinians, or even higher dimensional complex, split complex, and dual numbers comes into play and they leave their mark in the real number line which is the one and only ordered field, subtly shaping the unit circle the way it is. This significant influence makes the unit circle appear dual and more coherent, enabling the exploration of more intricate structures and relationships within the family of numbers. Emmy Noether, a brilliant mathematician of the early 20th century, made groundbreaking contributions to abstract algebra and theoretical physics. One of her most famous achievements is Noether's theorem, which connects symmetries in physical systems to conservation laws. Her work has had profound implications for both mathematics and physics, highlighting the deep connections between symmetry and the fundamental laws of nature. In simpler terms, if a system exhibits symmetry, e.g., rotational symmetry or translational symmetry, then there is a corresponding quantity that is conserved, e.g., angular momentum or linear momentum. In mathematics, especially in the realm of real numbers, we often deal with both positive and negative values. Positive and negative numbers are treated as symmetric around zero, with operations on negative numbers often seen as the inverse of operations on positive numbers. This symmetry is fundamental to our understanding of arithmetic, algebra, and many other areas of mathematics. However, the way we handle positive and negative values can sometimes seem limited, especially when considering higher dimensional spaces and more complex mathematical structures. In reality, the mathematical treatment of positive and negative numbers can sometimes feel asymmetric, particularly in certain contexts like complex analysis, vector spaces, and quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, symmetry plays a crucial role in understanding the behavior of particles and fields. Symmetry operations, such as parity, help describe physical phenomena in a way that treats positive and negative values on equal footing. Emmy Noether's theorem is especially relevant here, as it connects these symmetries to conservation laws. In higher dimensional spaces, such as vector spaces and tensor fields, the concept of symmetry becomes even more nuanced. Positive and negative values can be seen as part of a broader geometric structure where reflections, rotations, and other transformations preserve certain properties. This higher dimensional perspective provides a more unified view of positive and negative values. In the realm of complex numbers, for example, we extend the real number line into a two-dimensional plane. Here, the positive and negative sides of the real axis are just one aspect of a richer structure that includes imaginary numbers. The complex plane allows for a more symmetric treatment of values where rotations and reflections can be handled seamlessly. One intriguing question is whether the negative side can have a symmetric reflection on the higher dimensional positive side, similar to the concept of parity, which involves flipping the sign of spatial coordinates to conserve some quantity. This idea challenges the conventional view that negative values are merely inverses of positive values and suggests a more holistic approach to understanding mathematical structures. While this idea may seem unconventional, you have the choice to accept or stay behind. Mathematically, this can be inspected by considering transformations that map negative values to positive values in higher dimensions while preserving certain symmetries or invariants. For instance, in complex analysis, the reflection principle uses such symmetry to extend the domain of holomorphic functions. Similarly, in number theory and algebra, symmetries can reveal deep connections between seemingly disparate elements. This concept invites us to rethink the role of negative values and explore whether they can be more than just inverses, potentially offering new insights into the underlying structures of mathematics. I can guide you through a threefold path of depression, awakening, and enlightenment to help you decide, but ultimately, success depends on your dedication and various other factors you may already know. Like conservation laws in physics, in mathematics, the concepts of additive and multiplicative identities are fundamental and deeply intertwined with the structure of numbers and operations. The additive identity is a number which, when added to any number, leaves the original number unchanged. For real numbers, the additive identity is zero. The multiplicative identity is a number which, when multiplied by any number, leaves the original number unchanged. For real numbers, the multiplicative identity is 1. These identities are simple yet powerful, providing the foundation for more complex mathematical structures and operations. The additive and multiplicative identities are interconnected in various ways, particularly through their roles in different mathematical transformations and operations. Their interdependence is evident in several areas of mathematics, where they often appear together, ensuring the consistency and structure of mathematical systems. 
In trigonometry, identities that convert sums to products often involve both additive and multiplicative properties. For example, the sum to product identities for sine and cosine in the unit circle. Logarithms and exponentials also exhibit sum to product relationships, highlighting the interplay between addition and multiplication. For logarithms, it is the product rule. For exponentials, the addition of exponents corresponds to multiplication of the base. In number theory, the Riemann zeta function and its related functions often express sums as products. The various manifestations of additive and multiplicative identities across different areas of mathematics suggest a deeper underlying structure. While the specific forms and applications differ, they all reflect fundamental properties of numbers and operations that have been recognized since humans have understood and utilized it for millennia. At the core, the additive identity 0 and the multiplicative identity 1 are tied to the simplest operations of counting and the fundamental properties of real numbers and the concept of unit circle. If you really want to understand my work on dual unit circle then you need to write down some numerical identities in a piece of paper or sticky note and stick it on some visible place so that you can refer it when required. These numerical identities are 1 minus 1 equal to 0, 1 half multiplied by 2 equals 1, 1 half multiplied by e to the power ln 2 equals 1. All these identities arises out of additive identity and multiplicative identity or combination thereof. This simplest mantra you have to master to arrive a mental state suitable for Riemann hypothesis or dual unit circle. A mathematician should conserve what to the last. Mathematical abstracts like abstract algebra. Complex algebra complex analysis. Or all the math concepts you may know down to fundamental laws of arithmetic algebra. If time comes you have to give away everything, be ready to give it, you will earn it back elsewhere, but if someone asks for give away fundamental laws of arithmetic algebra and my fundamental formula of numbers, revolt back, fight till you die, don't give away those three laws, we are supposed to conserve those property of our ancestors for hand it over to our successors. We already have seen at pi 3 or pi 6 angle, also its periodic equivalence, the modulus 1 split opens into dual. Enlarge the picture into a sphere we shall get a shadow one leg in the half unit circle at and the other at dual unit circle. This looks cloudy like electron clouds changing their position with energy levels without even crossing the space between them. Spooky action at a distance or maybe we can't catch them that fast just now but in future maybe. Riemann built Riemann surfaces stitching the individual sheets where we had to take branch cuts to stop getting periodical duplicates. I have redrawn the Riemann sphere dividing into two hemispheres, point at infinity being shifted to real infinity. Northern hemispheres at southern hemispheres shall be different just like the differences between Arctic Oceans and Antarctica. Second key concept, we have logarithm of a negative number. This is particularly interesting because it involves branch cuts, discontinuities in the complex plane. The concept of the logarithm, particularly the natural logarithm, is a cornerstone in mathematics, primarily defined for positive real numbers. However, extending this concept to negative numbers and even imaginary numbers opens up intriguing possibilities. Traditionally, the logarithm of a negative number is undefined in the real number system because the exponential function, which the logarithm is the inverse of, never yields a negative value. In the complex plane, however, we can explore the logarithm of negative numbers using imaginary numbers. Specifically, the natural logarithm of a negative number involves the imaginary unit i, where i squared equals minus 1. Before we talk about logarithm of a negative number we should know the history behind the developments of the concept, the exponential function, denoted as e to the power x, has a rich history intertwined with the works of several prominent mathematicians. Its origins can be traced back to the early 17th century with John Napier and Jacob Bernoulli, and it was later explored extensively by Leonhard Euler, who connected it to some of the most beautiful results in mathematics. John Napier, a Scottish mathematician, is often credited with the discovery of logarithms in 1614. His work laid the groundwork for the exponential function, as logarithms are the inverse of exponentiation. Napier introduced logarithms as a means to simplify complex calculations, particularly in astronomy and navigation. He developed tables of logarithms, which provided a new tool for mathematicians and scientists to multiply and divide large numbers more efficiently. Around the same time, Jacob Bernoulli, a Swiss mathematician, contributed to the understanding of exponential growth through his studies on compound interest. 
Bernoulli examined the process of continuously compounding interest and discovered that as the number of compounding periods per year increases indefinitely, the value approaches a limit. This limit, now known as the number E, approximately equal to 2.71828, became a fundamental constant in mathematics. The Swiss mathematician Leonhard Euler made significant contributions to the theory of exponential functions in the 18th century. Euler was the first to use the notation E for the base of the natural logarithm, and he explored the properties of the exponential function in depth. One of his most famous results is Euler's identity, which connects the exponential function to trigonometry and complex numbers in a surprising and elegant way. Euler's identity is often celebrated as one of the most beautiful equations in mathematics because it combines five fundamental mathematical constants as you may know. This equation exemplifies the deep interconnections between different areas of mathematics. The exponential function possesses several remarkable properties that make it unique and extremely useful in calculus. One of the most striking properties of the exponential function is that its derivative is the function itself. This property implies that the exponential function grows at a rate proportional to its current value, which is a key characteristic of exponential growth. This self-similarity is rare among functions and makes particularly significant in mathematical modeling of growth and decay processes. Magically, the integral is also the function itself. So the exponential function remains unchanged under both differentiation and integration, reinforcing its fundamental role in calculus. The concept of the dual unit circle reveals new avenues for integrating complex numbers along the real number line. This approach realizes high-dimensional contributions while allowing the exploration of rich structures within the framework of additive and multiplicative inverses. The natural logarithm of 2 is a significant constant in mathematics. It appears frequently in problems involving exponential growth, binary systems, and information theory. By redefining imaginary number i, we leverage this constant to provide a more consistent and potentially richer framework for handling negative logarithms. One of the most crucial aspects of any such redefinition is ensuring that the rich structures in mathematics are preserved. By scaling the imaginary unit with a natural logarithm constant, we align our theoretical framework with existing mathematical properties, maintaining the integrity of complex functions, periodicity, and multivalued aspects of logarithms. Once we accept the existence of a real value for the imaginary number i, the natural logarithm of 2 becomes a suitable candidate for further exploration. One compelling approach is to define the natural logarithm of minus 1 in terms of the successive logarithms of natural logarithm of 2 multiplied by 2. By doing so, we avoid the complexities of branch cuts, discontinuities in the complex plane that arise when defining multivalued functions like the complex logarithm. The issue with negative logarithms in the real number system highlights the need for a more comprehensive approach within the complex plane. By proposing a redefinition of the imaginary unit i in terms of ln, too, we can address some of the caveats associated with negative logarithms while preserving the rich structures inherent in complex analysis. This approach offers an innovative way to reconcile the limitations of real numbers with the broader and more versatile framework of complex numbers. I did my work inspired from real numbers, at the end if you buy it then complex, hyper-complex, split-complex, dual numbers all get merged with real numbers with appropriate higher dimensional scalar and a base of your choice for imaginary number iota, my natural suggestion is ln2. I saw the potential of applying it to exotic numbers like up arrow notations, tree 3, etc but never ventured. Perhaps the branch cut problem ends with the selection of the base, of course we need to keep on using the successive logarithm of the main base we take for lateral, four different families of complex numbers, verticals we need to leave open for future enthusiasts to explore other exotic numbers. The periods will be directly handled by the imaginary parts, I mean the real coefficient of imaginary parts. Third and final concept in this paper on the proof of Riemann hypothesis is Riemann hypothesis itself. I titled my paper, Numbers are Three-Dimensional, my motivation was to take my readers out of comfort zone of two-dimensional complex numbers. Before we delve into the process of extending the domain of the Riemann zeta function and my personal journey in attempting to prove Riemann hypothesis, let's first grasp the essence of what the hypothesis is all about. The Riemann hypothesis was formulated by Bernard Riemann, a German mathematician, in 1859. It revolves around the distribution of prime numbers and their connection to the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. 
The Riemann zeta function is a complex-valued function defined for complex numbers s with a real part greater than 1. It is computed by summing the reciprocals of all positive integers raised to the power of minus s, starting from 1 and continuing infinitely. In other words, zetas is expressed as the sum of 1 to the power minus s plus 2 to the power minus s plus 3 to the power minus s plus, and so on, extending to infinity. To broaden the domain of the Riemann zeta function, we generally employ a technique known as analytic continuation. Analytic continuation enables us to extend the definition of a function to a larger domain. In the case of the zeta function, we can extend it to the entire complex plane, excluding the point s equals 1, where it possesses a simple pole. Now, here's where it becomes intriguing. The Riemann hypothesis states that all non-trivial zeros of the zeta function reside on a critical line in the complex plane, characterized by the equation real of s equals to 1 half. By extending the domain of the zeta function further, we may gain the ability to explore these non-trivial zeros and strive to establish the validity of the Riemann hypothesis. Various techniques, such as functional equations, integral representations, and Conto integration, are typically used to extend the domain of the zeta function. However, in my approach, I departed from these conventional methods and continued Euler's unfinished work by employing an induction process that involved taking infinite products of zeta values. Through this approach, I obtained initial results that challenged established notions, such as zeta, 1, being equal to 1 instead of infinity and zeta, minus 1, being equal to 1 half rather than Ramanujan's value of minus 1 twelfth. This deviation from conventional thinking led me to propose both the existence and completion of algebraic cycles involving at least the zeta function. I realized that the poles of the zeta function could not be left unaddressed and intuited that their removal might hold the key to proving the Riemann hypothesis. If zeta, zero, leads us to minus one half and zeta, one half, is connected to all zeta zeros, then there must be a complex cycle that mathematicians have thus far overlooked. I visualized the Riemann hypothesis as a cyclic challenge and I reopened the problem in a fresh manner. Because of the entangled relationship between the gamma and zeta functions, I suspected that the gamma function may also be rotating around some other functions. I constructed a handwoven garland, interweaving various flowers representing zeta values from various branches of the cross-pollinated zeta function, gamma function, pi function, my own delta function, and their periodic harmonic conjugates. These branches stem from two fundamental trees, the unified factorial tree and the unified zeta tree. While studying the prime number theorem, I came to know that the prime number theorem is actually proven from the results of the zeta function. I questioned myself why the zeta function could not be defined at 1 and why its pole could not be removed. Although calculus provides certain rules for checking the convergence of infinite series, these may prove insufficient when dealing with the convergence of series encapsulating infinities into an unity in a cyclic way. Despite this, Euler successfully derived his sum to product formulas and manually calculated zeta values for certain numbers. Later, Leopold Kronecker further elucidated Euler's formulas by interpreting them as the outcome of approaching the right-sided limit of S. In my pursuit, I decided to follow Euler's approach, considering him as my greatest inspiration, and sought to explore how the zeta function diverges at 1 and to introduce new mathematical tools that may be presently absent from the existing context in order to renormalize this infinity. The journey was far from easy, but I firmly believe that perseverance is the key to success. I approached each setback with a positive mindset, recognizing that failure provides valuable lessons and insights. It served as an opportunity for me to reassess my approach, identify weaknesses, and deepen my understanding of the number line. Being in a different world, I lack the ability to engage with other mathematicians and researchers to exchange ideas, seek feedback, and encouragement. Nevertheless, I harnessed my self-taught nature and broke the problem down into smaller, manageable pieces. For example, I encountered challenges with the poles of the gamma function, which led me to introduce an additional factorial function to create a twisted pair with the gamma function. I also sought to find an alternate functional equation to remove the pole of the zeta function, among other considerations. During the process, I took regular long breaks to rest and approached the problem with fresh ideas. I celebrated every bit of progress I made, regardless of how small it may have seemed. I recognized that each step forward not only brought me closer to my ultimate goal but also expanded my knowledge and revealed new insights that would aid me in future endeavors. 
Now, let me provide you with a summary of the results I have achieved thus far. The Riemann hypothesis has been proven in three different ways, each with varying levels of complexity. One approach involves utilizing the functional equation and introducing the concept of the delta function and the periodic harmonic conjugate of the gamma and delta functions. The other two proofs are derived using Euler's formula and elementary algebra. The poles and zeros of zeta values are redefined. Furthermore, other prime conjectures, such as the Goldbach conjecture and the twin prime conjecture, have been proven based on a new understanding of primes and numbers as three-dimensional entities, as elucidated by Hamilton's four-dimensional quaternion. The imaginary number iota is defined as the natural logarithm of two, and the logarithm of negative and complex numbers is redefined using an extended number system. Additionally, the factorial of negative and complex numbers is redefined through the use of the delta function and the periodic harmonic conjugate of the gamma and delta functions. Now let me take you on a detour of my personal journey so far. As an accountant, I typically don't engage with scientific concepts in my daily life. However, my curiosity was piqued on Christmas Eve in 2012 when there was a hoax circulating that the world would end by December 31st. Although the hoax lacked scientific basis, it compelled me to seek the truth and explore contemporary scientific understanding of the universe. I began by reading Wikipedia articles on physics, a subject that had always interested me despite my limited knowledge from school. It was during this exploration that I encountered a pie chart illustrating the composition of the universe, 69% dark energy, 26% dark matter, and 5% normal matter. This distribution didn't sit well with me. I had a sense that something fundamental must be missing. In 2015, I returned to my hometown of Kolkata, India because of the Syrian crisis. My eldest son started attending third grade at his school, and one day while searching the internet for fraction worksheets to help him practice, I realized that the seemingly simple numbers I encountered in my daily life were not as straightforward as they appeared. Using my Excel skills, I spent four hours trying to figure out how to create randomized fractional math problems for my son. I discovered that to generate proper fractions for multiplication and division problems, final result of which didn't result in recurring decimals, I needed to divide any random input numbers by its larger multiples of 5. I hypothesized that this phenomenon was due to the decimal system we use, with 5 acting as a midpoint. On another occasion, I encountered the fine structure constant, which has an approximate fractional value of 1 upon 137. I couldn't help but notice that it was nearly half of the reciprocal of Charles' constant ratio of 1 upon 273, which I had learned about in school. I struggled to immediately understand the significance of this observation but attributed it to the same midpoint theory I had developed, inspired by concepts of balance and averages in financial accounting. You must be thinking that I made a mistake when I said fine structure constant is half of Charles' constant. I am talking in the sense of denominator, numerator is always reserved for one in my thought process. One day, while browsing through Wikipedia, I stumbled upon a list of unsolved physics problems, which led me to another list of unsolved mathematical problems. The latter list was relatively shorter, and I found myself captivated by the Riemann hypothesis, one of the seven Millennium Prize problems. Drawing upon my self-constructed midpoint theory and its rudimentary connection to the Riemann hypothesis, I pondered why such an elegant proposition had remained unsolved for over a century and a half. I took it upon myself to tackle this monumental challenge, starting from scratch. In 2019, I began with Euler's version of the zeta function and employed an induction method into Euler's. I grasped why the Riemann hypothesis ought to be true. My initial elementary proof required just expanding Euler's sum to product form of zeta function in terms of complex numbers with inspiration from Riemann's work, and I saw a mystical connection with once again the great Euler's work, known as Euler's identity, involving the unit circle. I was clueless on the reason for such an uncommon connection for few days, but one fine day the revelations came when I let it come naturally through our unbiased, thoughtless state of mind. Here I felt the grand scheme of unity among the diversities which is also prominent among the real numbers as all the real numbers carry one common factor among themselves which is none other than an one. To double check I also tried to apply it on Riemann's collapsed telescopic product form of zeta function. Here I had to play a little bit with the signs to come to the same conclusion. This exercise also triggered my intuition whether negative domain plays an equal important role in mathematics answer to which I shall discover in my future endeavor. 
Frankly speaking, we do not play much with the negative side in our current math. However, my initial elementary proof was met with rejection. In 2020, the world was gripped by the COVID-19 pandemic and I found myself unemployed and confined to lockdown. This presented me with ample time to focus on unraveling the Riemann hypothesis. I realized that my initial elementary proof lacked the novel mathematical insights necessary for such a pivotal problem. I began to accumulate the pitfalls of contemporary mathematics, which may be the reason why we lack the tools to solve the Riemann hypothesis, as acclaimed mathematician Terence Dow once remarked in an interview. I observed that the imaginary number iota had ensnared both mathematicians and physicists in its imaginary realm, keeping them engrossed. My initial elementary proof called for a half-unit circle, contradicting the conventional notion of a unit circle. Here I gathered enough courage to break open the singularity situation of negative logarithm into a dual situation involving quaternion and come out with the idea of real value for imaginary number iota will fix the caveat of negative logarithm into some real calculations. I had discovered a way using calculus to incorporate a dual unit circle within the familiar concept of a unit circle, but further justification was needed. Although complex analysis was not my cup of tea, I delved into it to ensure that my work did not violate any principles. I found no such violations, yet I encountered only rejections. Returning to Riemann's functional equation, I sought to develop a more rigorous approach. I came across a particular theorem in complex analysis known as the harmonic conjugate theorem, which states that if a function is analytic in a given region, there must exist a harmonic conjugate of the original function. I realized that if I could slightly modify Riemann's functional equation by replacing the gamma function with an equivalent that is not undefined at 1, I could potentially eliminate the function pole. I understood that this would challenge the well-established divergence of the harmonic series, as proven by Nicole Orisma centuries ago. But residue theorem, Grandi's series manipulation helped me to remain in the picture. This journey led me to introduce a new zeta function that spiraled cyclically to form a continuum with these cycles serving as placeholders for infinity. However, I soon realized that I had inadvertently opened Pandora's box, giving rise to additional complications and dilemmas along the way. In order to tackle these novel problems, I found it necessary to revisit Euler's gamma function and create a variant of it which I named the delta function. However, even with this new function, I encountered challenges and uncertainties in my pursuit of unraveling the Riemann hypothesis. The journey continues and I remain dedicated to the exploration of these mind-boggling ideas, seeking to make a meaningful contribution to the fields of physics and mathematics. I still faced an incomplete picture. To fill in the missing pieces I delved into the uncharted territories of negative factorial functions and introduced two additional functions that served as periodic conjugates as well as the inverses of the original gamma function and the newly discovered delta function. With these five factorial functions, gamma remaining the central one, I was able to extend the domain of factorials to negative numbers and the domain of the zeta function to negative even numbers. The sign manipulations I did in my elementary proofs showing it to be zero in the background now became manageable using reflection properties of gamma and zeta function. Some other transformations gave me the alternate functional equation. I was good to go now. I brought all these components together and observed that the functional equation for my harmonic conjugate zeta function provided the long-awaited proof for the Riemann hypothesis. Yes, I had achieved it. I celebrated the victory brought about by the pi 3 or pi 6 angles, which propelled me into higher dimensions and granted me the proof. I got a reconfirmation it takes three sides to make a triangle, and a triangle with zero area completes a cycle but reduced to a dot. It is worth noting that one ray of the pi 4 angles also extends into the fourth dimension and has a presence in the unit sphere. The loop in square root of two problem identified by Terence Howard also get resolved in my dual unit circle penetrating through pi at four angles. Due to the popularity of calculus, Euler's number E has become more widely known than pi, which remained primarily associated with the study of geometry, particularly the geometry of circles. In my research paper, I hinted at the possibility of pi serving as a base for complex logarithms where hyperbolic numbers in its exponent yield the conjugate form of Euler's formula pi to the power imaginary number j and i equals minus 1. I sought natural occurrences that could validate this novel idea, but lacking access to astronomical data for verification, I turned to Google for information on the 60 degrees latitude. 
the 60 degrees latitude line runs parallel to the equator at a latitude of 60 degrees both north and south. One notable example is the Southern Ocean, which surrounds Antarctica. As the 60 degrees south latitude line traverses this region, it encounters vast expanses of open water with no significant land masses, resembling the notion of zero in relation to the zeta zeros. In the Northern Hemisphere, the 60 degrees north latitude line passes through the Arctic Ocean, while various islands exist within the Arctic Circle, such as Greenland, Svalbard, and the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. The specific stretch along the 60 degrees north latitude may also cross areas of open water, particularly during warmer months when sea ice melts. Although the presence or absence of land along the 60 degrees latitude line can be influenced by factors such as tides, seasonal ice formation, and climate conditions, these regions are generally characterized by expansive stretches of open water without significant land masses intersecting the 60 degrees latitude line directly. After obtaining a natural signature, as described earlier, I expanded my investigations to more generalized conditions, such as the entire galaxy and the universe, in an attempt to solve the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. The intriguing coincidence of dark energy's percentage being equal to the natural logarithm of 2 arises from the numerical proximity between the current estimate of the ratio of dark energy's energy density to the critical density of the universe. In the field of cosmology, dark energy is a hypothetical form of energy believed to be responsible for the observed accelerated expansion of the universe. Its properties and nature are still not well understood, making it an ongoing subject of scientific inquiry. Similar to how the critical line of the zeta function is responsible for the infinitude of primes and the number system, dark energy also derives its energy from the power of the number line. Even though the universe may be spatially and temporally infinite, it operates in a manner similar to the number line, which diverges to infinity, crossing an infinite number of cycles like e to the power 11, e to the power 22, e to the power 33, and so on. I derived the last two numbers mentioned using only a few physical constants, such as the speed of light, Planck's constant, Newton's gravitational constant, Boltzmann's constant, mass of the electron, and the Charles gas constant. Yes, you heard it correctly, the Charles gas constant. The intriguing numerical relationship between the fine structure constant and half of the Charles ratio of an ideal gas has kept me awake at night. Connecting the dots to complete the picture requires a certain level of imagination. The fine structure constant, denoted by alpha, is a fundamental constant in physics that characterizes the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between charged particles. Its value is close to 1, 137. The fine structure constant is dimensionless and plays a crucial role in various areas of physics, including quantum electrodynamics. On the other hand, the Charles ratio is a constant that arises from the ideal gas law and relates the change in volume of an ideal gas to its change in temperature at constant pressure. Approximately, this ratio is close to 1, 273. Although the Charles gas constant is not considered a fundamental constant, it should be regarded as more fundamental in the middle scale in which we live. Mathematically, it is closely related to the reciprocal of pi caret 4 multiplied by Euler's number e, the base of the natural logarithm. Can you imagine the possibilities that arise from connecting these seemingly disparate constants? The interplay between the fine structure constant, the Charles ratio, and other fundamental constants hints at a deeper underlying structure in the fabric of our universe. Exploring these connections may lead to new insights and a more comprehensive understanding of the laws governing our reality. As I continued my investigations, I stumbled upon an unexpected relationship between the Riemann zeta function and the fine structure constant. This connection seemed to imply that the behavior of the zeta function at certain critical points could be linked to the fine structure constant, shedding light on the mysterious nature of both. This intriguing discovery hints at deeper underlying principles governing the universe. I would like to pay homage to Sir Michael Atiyah, a mathematical giant who made significant contributions to various fields, including topology and geometry. In his last days, he proposed a solution to the Riemann hypothesis only to face harsh trolling and criticism. He was right when he tried to connect zeta function with fine structure constant. I independently worked on the same since 2012 to 2020. I saw him getting trolled, and since then I stopped sending my paper to any journals for publication. It is deeply saddening to see such a distinguished figure treated with disrespect. To those who trolled and belittled him, remember that even the greatest minds can face challenges and setbacks. 
Instead of mocking, we should honor their lifelong dedication and contributions to advancing human knowledge. Sir Michael Atiyah's legacy will continue to inspire mathematicians and scholars for generations to come. One of earliest work without the intricacies of negative factorials or the inverses of factorial functions actually got published in 2023. I opened my YouTube channel in late 2023. The idea was educate people on my work. Traffic is getting better every day. To reach more people I need to translate my speech and post videos regularly with different voices. I am working on that because multilingual track facilities is not available to small YouTubers. On the closure note my focus was always on achieving the zero state so I started with zero in my hand, someone said the universe is a closed circuit, while any other degrees of freedom were secondary considerations. This singular pursuit eventually led me down a roller coaster path of duality, at times losing myself in the vastness of infinity. However, my desire to return safely to my starting point served as a compass, guiding me through the boundless expanse. After catching a glimpse of the greatest zero of all time and space of which, the zeros of the zeta function was merely a subset, I found myself overwhelmed and succumbed to a deep slumber. Upon awakening, I discovered a minus one in the palm of my hand, symbolizing my encounter with the great zero. Euler had seen it his way, and I had seen it my way, yet we both arrived at minus one. If you embark on this voyage and complete the cycle of three, you too will receive the gift of an additional minus one through some unknown transporters, don't get into the hesitations, I didn't order this, open the package after scanning and place it meaningfully to maintain equilibrium in any equation. I chose to position mine in the exponent to solve the Riemann hypothesis, but it should be wielded wisely, as it has the potential to unleash infinite possibilities at any moment of time, if you select a wrong place it can burst like a nuclear bomb disaster. In my paper, I have provided minimal proofs for various unsolved number theory problems. I refer to these proofs as minimal because they emerge from the already proven prime number theorem. Once we understand the duality of the number system and its oscillation around the limit of two, the dual nature of numbers refers to the observation that prime numbers exhibit both irregular and seemingly random patterns as well as certain statistical properties that can be analyzed through probabilistic methods. For example, let's consider the twin prime conjecture, which states that there are infinitely many prime numbers that differ by two. To approach this problem, we can utilize the prime number theorem and the dual nature of numbers. By invoking the prime number theorem and considering the asymptotic limit of prime numbers, we can reverse engineer it to know about the roots of any number and thus we can show that there will always be infinitely many twin primes with a prime gap of two. This can be seen as a minimal proof for the twin prime conjecture. Similarly, the Goldbach conjecture, which states that every even integer greater than 2 can be expressed as the sum of two prime numbers, could also be approached using the prime number theorem and the dual nature of numbers. It's important to note that while these minimal proofs may provide insights and a deeper understanding of number theory problems, they may not necessarily be considered complete or rigorous proofs. Number theory problems, especially those that have remained unsolved for a long time, often require extensive mathematical techniques and rigorous proofs to be fully resolved. As promised in my last video today, we shall explore a revolutionary concept, the integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system. This idea promises to enhance our understanding of mathematics and extend its applications. Let's dive into the history, basic concepts, attempts at integration, and my unique approach to this intriguing endeavor, which includes a modified place value system and novel decimal operations. To appreciate the integration of complex numbers with the decimal system, we must first understand their origins. The decimal number system, also known as the base, 10 system, dates back to ancient civilizations like the Egyptians and the Babylonians. It was formalized by Indian mathematicians and spread to the Western world through the works of Islamic scholars. On the other hand, complex numbers have a more tumultuous history. The notion of imaginary numbers emerged in the 16th century when mathematicians like Cardano grappled with solutions to cubic equations that involved the square root of negative numbers. The formal acceptance and development of complex numbers came later, with significant contributions from Euler, Gauss, and others in the 18th and 19th centuries. The decimal number system is a positional numeral system that uses 10 digits, from 0 to 9. Each digit's position represents a power of 10, allowing for the representation of both whole numbers and fractional numbers. Complex numbers, on the other hand, consist of a real part and an imaginary part. 
This extension of the real numbers allows for the solution of equations that have no real solutions. This concept might seem abstract, but it has practical applications in fields like engineering, physics, and computer science. Historically, the integration of complex numbers into the decimal system hasn't been a mainstream focus. However, there have been efforts to unify different complex number systems under broader mathematical frameworks. For example, hypercomplex numbers, including quaternions and actonians, extend complex numbers to higher dimensions. These efforts demonstrate the potential for a unified numerical system. I don't know why complex numbers and the decimal system have remained separate entities. Being an Indian guy from the East where decimal system took birth, I propose a possible integration thereof with the complex numbers from the West. The challenge is to find a way to integrate these systems seamlessly. Imagine if we could extend the familiar and intuitive decimal system to include complex numbers, providing a unified framework that simplifies calculations and broadens our mathematical toolkit. Allow me to present my approach towards integrating complex numbers with the decimal number system. This vision involves a modified place value system and novel rules for decimal operations to seamlessly incorporate complex numbers. In this framework, the first imaginary part has a place value of 100 and every subsequent imaginary part increases by 10 times its predecessor. Thus, the place values for the imaginary parts are 100, 1000, 10,000, and so on. This system preserves the hierarchical structure of the decimal system while extending it to accommodate complex numbers. We introduce a unique rule for operations involving the signs of imaginary parts. If the imaginary part has a positive sign, it multiplies the real part. Conversely, if the imaginary part has a negative sign, it divides the real part. This rule integrates the effects of the imaginary components into the real number operations in a consistent and logical manner. In this system, imaginary numbers are replaced by starting with the natural logarithm of 2 and its successive logarithms. This substitution grounds the imaginary parts in well-known mathematical constants, providing a bridge between real and complex numbers. The problematic point will be negative logarithm of minus 1 which also can be fixed or replaced by double of the natural logarithm of 2 following the definition of imaginary number iota. This approach is consistent with the principles of the decimal system and the properties of complex numbers. By integrating complex numbers in this way, we create a seamless transition from real to complex numbers. Furthermore, this framework can unify hypercomplex numbers, such as quaternions and aptonians, by extending the positional system into higher dimensions. Each dimension could represent a different component of these hypercomplex numbers, preserving the structural integrity of the decimal system while accommodating greater complexity. Integrating complex numbers with the decimal number system through a modified place value system and my novel rules for decimal operations is a practical and innovative step towards unifying various numerical systems. By viewing complex numbers as an extended decimal system with unique place values and operational rules, we preserve consistency and open the door to unifying more complex number systems. This vision holds the promise of a more cohesive and comprehensive mathematical framework, enhancing our understanding and application of numbers in diverse fields. Thank you for your attention, and I hope this exploration has sparked your curiosity and appreciation for the innovative possibilities in the world of mathematics. As with any groundbreaking idea, the integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system is bound to face scrutiny and criticism. This is a natural part of the process of advancing knowledge and pushing the boundaries of what we understand. Let me address some of the probable criticisms and defend my propositions with clarity and conviction. One of the primary criticisms may be that this new system is too complex and impractical for everyday use. Critics might argue that the modified place value system and new rules for operations add unnecessary layers of complication. While the proposed system introduces new concepts, it builds on the familiar structure of the decimal system. The place value modification and the rule of signs are designed to maintain consistency and logic within the system. The use of natural logarithms provides a mathematically rigorous foundation that can unify real and complex numbers. In practical terms, the adoption of this system can be incremental, starting in advanced fields like theoretical mathematics, physics, and engineering, where the benefits of a unified numerical framework are most pronounced. Another criticism might come from a purist mathematical perspective, arguing that such a system disrupts the elegance and simplicity of existing mathematical structures. 
Mathematics has a history of evolving to incorporate new ideas that initially seemed counterintuitive or complex. The acceptance of zero, negative numbers, and even complex numbers themselves were met with resistance. Yet, these concepts have become fundamental to modern mathematics. My approach is not to replace existing systems but to extend them, providing a new perspective that enriches our understanding and opens up new possibilities for exploration and application. As we delve into the integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system, one aspect of my proposal is likely to attract significant criticism, the replacement of the imaginary unit with the natural logarithm of two and its successive logarithms. Let me address and defend this part of my proposition in detail. Critics might argue that replacing the imaginary unit with natural logarithm of two and its successive logarithms undermines the mathematical legitimacy and rigor of complex numbers, as the imaginary unit iota has a well-defined and fundamental property. While the imaginary unit iota is indeed fundamental in traditional complex number theory, my proposal aims to reinterpret the imaginary component in a way that is consistent with logarithmic growth. The use of natural logarithm of two and its successive logarithms grounds the imaginary part in well-known mathematical constants that also exhibit a clear, hierarchical relationship. This transformation does not negate the properties of iota but rather provides a new framework that could offer deeper insights, especially in fields that already make extensive use of logarithmic functions, such as information theory and signal processing. Another criticism may focus on the conceptual clarity and intuition of replacing iota with logarithms, arguing that this substitution could confuse rather than clarify the understanding of complex numbers. The integration of natural logarithms into the imaginary component introduces a new layer of conceptual clarity by linking complex numbers directly to exponential and logarithmic growth, which are pervasive in nature and various scientific disciplines. For instance, exponential growth is fundamental in fields ranging from population dynamics to finance. By expressing the imaginary part in terms of logarithms, we provide a bridge to these applications, making the abstract concept of iota more tangible and relevant. Furthermore, as students and practitioners become accustomed to this new framework, the initial confusion will give way to a deeper, more intuitive grasp of complex relationships. Critics might be concerned about the impact this change will have on existing theorems, applications, and computations that rely on the traditional definition of iota. My approach is not intended to replace the existing framework but to provide an alternative perspective that can coexist with traditional complex number theory. Existing theorems and applications remain valid within their established contexts. However, in areas where logarithmic relationships are more prevalent, this new framework could offer enhanced computational and conceptual tools. Over time, mathematicians and scientists may develop new theorems and applications that leverage this reinterpretation, leading to novel insights and advancements. Educators might express concern about the difficulty of teaching this new system, especially when students are already grappling with traditional concepts. Education is about preparing students to think critically and adapt to new ideas. Introducing this system can be seen as an opportunity to deepen students' understanding of mathematical concepts and their interrelations. By gradually integrating these ideas into advanced mathematics curricula, we can provide students with a more comprehensive toolkit that will serve them well in various scientific and engineering disciplines. Established fields that rely on current mathematical systems, such as engineering, physics, computing, and advanced technologies, might resist adopting a new numerical framework. Innovation often encounters resistance, but it also drives progress. The proposed system's primary applications lie in advanced theoretical work and cutting-edge technologies. Over time, as the benefits become evident, more fields may adopt the new framework. Additionally, this system does not mandate an immediate overhaul of existing practices, it can coexist with current systems, offering an alternative approach where beneficial. In any paradigm shift, there may be skepticism aimed at the proponents of the new idea. Critics might question the credibility or motivations behind such a proposal. Throughout history, many pioneers in science and mathematics have faced personal attacks and skepticism. It is crucial to stay focused on the merits of the idea and the potential it holds for advancing our understanding. My motivations are rooted in a genuine desire to explore new frontiers in mathematics and to contribute to the body of knowledge in a meaningful way. Constructive criticism is welcome as it helps refine and improve the proposition. However, personal attacks will not deter the pursuit of progress. 
Defending the integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system requires a steadfast belief in the value of innovation and an open-minded approach to criticism. By addressing concerns thoughtfully and demonstrating the potential benefits of this new framework, we can foster a productive dialogue that ultimately advances our understanding and application of mathematics. Change is challenging, but it is also necessary for growth and discovery. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system through a modified place value system and novel operational rules is a practical and innovative step towards unifying various numerical systems. By viewing complex numbers as an extended decimal system with unique place values and logarithmic replacements, we preserve consistency and open the door to unifying more complex number systems. This vision holds the promise of a more cohesive and comprehensive mathematical framework, enhancing our understanding and application of numbers in diverse fields. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to engaging in further discussions and explorations of this exciting concept. As we stand on the brink of unprecedented technological advancements, the integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system opens up a myriad of possibilities. This novel concept can significantly impact two of the most transformative fields of our time, quantum computing and artificial intelligence, AI. By merging these mathematical frameworks, we can push the boundaries of what is possible, enhancing computational efficiency, accuracy, and capabilities. Quantum computing operates on the principles of quantum mechanics, harnessing the unique properties of quantum bits, quits, that can exist in multiple states simultaneously. This characteristic, known as superposition, along with entanglement, allows quantum computers to perform complex calculations at speeds unattainable by classical computers. Traditionally, quantum states are represented using complex numbers. By integrating these complex numbers into the decimal system, we can develop a more unified and intuitive framework for representing quantum states. This could simplify the mathematical models used in quantum algorithms, making them more accessible and easier to understand. Quantum error correction is a critical challenge in the development of reliable quantum computers. The novel system of representing complex numbers with a modified place value system and natural logarithms could lead to more robust error correcting codes. These codes would leverage the hierarchical and logarithmic structure to detect and correct errors more efficiently, enhancing the stability and reliability of quantum computations. Quantum algorithms, such as Shear's algorithm for factoring large numbers and Grover's algorithm for searching unsorted databases, rely heavily on complex number computations. By integrating complex numbers with the decimal system, we can streamline these algorithms, potentially leading to faster and more efficient computations. This integration could also facilitate the development of new quantum algorithms that leverage the unique properties of the simplex number system. Artificial intelligence, particularly in areas like machine learning and neural networks, relies on complex mathematical operations to process and analyze vast amounts of data. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal system can enhance these operations in several ways. Neural networks often use complex numbers to model certain types of data and relationships. By adopting the integrated complex decimal system, we can develop more advanced neural network architectures that are capable of handling complex data more efficiently. This could lead to improvements in tasks such as image recognition, natural language processing, and predictive analytics. The hierarchical and logarithmic structure of the integrated system allows for a more nuanced representation of data. This can improve the way AI models interpret and process information, leading to more accurate predictions and insights. For instance, in the realm of deep learning, this system could enhance the way features are extracted and weighted, resulting in more robust models. Machine learning algorithms, such as gradient descent, rely on complex number calculations to optimize model parameters. The new framework can simplify these calculations, making the optimization process more efficient. This could lead to faster training times and more accurate models, accelerating the development and deployment of AI technologies. One of the most exciting possibilities is the creation of a unified mathematical framework that seamlessly integrates AI and quantum computing. By leveraging the integrated complex decimal system, we can develop hybrid quantum classical algorithms that combine the strengths of both paradigms. This could lead to breakthroughs in fields like quantum machine learning, where quantum computers enhance the capabilities of classical AI models. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system represents a bold and innovative step towards advancing quantum computing and artificial intelligence. 
By providing a more intuitive, robust, and efficient mathematical framework, this novel concept has the potential to unlock new possibilities and drive transformative advancements in these fields. As we continue to explore and refine this integration, we can look forward to a future where the boundaries of computation and intelligence are continually expanded, leading to a deeper understanding of the universe and more powerful technological tools. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to engaging in further discussions on the exciting potential of this groundbreaking idea. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system offers a revolutionary framework that can transform various fields, including human disease drug development, genetic modification, and cancer treatment. By merging these mathematical systems, we can enhance computational models, improve data analysis, and develop innovative approaches to tackle some of the most challenging problems in medicine and biotechnology. The process of drug development is intricate and time-consuming, requiring precise modeling and analysis of biological systems and molecular interactions. The integrated complex decimal system can significantly impact this field in several ways. Computational models used in pharmacology often rely on complex numbers to simulate the behavior of drugs within the human body. By integrating complex numbers with the decimal system, we can develop more accurate and efficient models. This can improve the prediction of drug behavior, including absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, ADME, leading to faster and more reliable drug development processes. Molecular dynamic simulations are essential for understanding the interactions between drugs and their target proteins. The novel framework can simplify these simulations by providing a more intuitive representation of molecular interactions. This can enhance our ability to identify potential drug candidates and optimize their efficacy and safety. The hierarchical and logarithmic structure of the integrated system allows for more efficient data analysis and pattern recognition. This can expedite the identification of promising drug compounds from large datasets, reducing the time and cost associated with drug discovery. Genetic modification involves altering the genetic material of organisms to achieve desired traits. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal system can advance this field by improving the precision and efficiency of genetic engineering techniques. Gene editing technologies, such as CRISPR, Cas9, rely on precise targeting and modification of specific DNA sequences. The new mathematical framework can enhance the algorithms used to design and optimize guide RNAs, increasing the accuracy and efficiency of gene editing. Genetic modification requires the analysis of vast amounts of genomic data. The integrated system can streamline this analysis, allowing researchers to identify genetic variations and their functional impacts more efficiently. This can accelerate the development of genetically modified organisms with desired traits, such as disease resistance or improved nutritional content. Synthetic biology involves designing and constructing new biological parts and systems. The complex decimal integration can provide a more robust foundation for modeling and simulating synthetic biological systems, leading to more reliable and scalable synthetic biology applications. Cancer treatment is a multifaceted challenge that requires precise targeting of cancer cells while minimizing damage to healthy tissues. The novel mathematical framework can significantly contribute to the development of more effective and personalized cancer therapies. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system holds the potential to revolutionize human disease drug development, genetic modification, and cancer treatment. By providing a more intuitive, robust, and efficient mathematical framework, this novel concept can enhance computational models, improve data analysis, and lead to innovative approaches in medicine and biotechnology. As we continue to explore and refine this integration, we can look forward to groundbreaking advancements that improve human health and well-being. Thank you for your attention, and I am excited to engage in further discussions on the transformative potential of this groundbreaking idea. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system, hereby termed the simplex number system, represents a revolutionary framework that can significantly advance various fields. In information technology and telecommunication, this novel system can enhance computational efficiency, data representation, signal processing, and encryption, among other areas. Let's explore the potential applications of the simplex number system in these fields. Data storage and compression are critical for managing the vast amounts of information generated daily. The simplex number system can provide a more efficient representation of complex data, reducing storage requirements and improving compression algorithms. 
By leveraging the hierarchical structure and logarithmic relationships, we can develop more advanced data compression techniques that preserve data integrity while minimizing storage space. Many algorithms in computer science, such as those used in graphics processing, machine learning, and numerical analysis, involve complex number calculations. The simplex number system can streamline these computations, leading to faster and more efficient algorithms. This improvement can enhance the performance of various applications, from rendering high-quality graphics to training deep learning models. Cryptographic algorithms rely on complex mathematical operations to secure data. The simplex number system can introduce new methods for encryption and decryption, leveraging the unique properties of the integrated complex decimal framework. This can enhance the security of digital communications and transactions, making it more difficult for malicious actors to breach cryptographic defenses. Error detection and correction are essential for maintaining data integrity in digital systems. The simplex number system can improve the design of error-correcting codes, such as Reed solomon and LDPC codes, by providing a more robust mathematical foundation. This can enhance the reliability of data transmission and storage, reducing the likelihood of data corruption and loss. Signal processing is at the heart of telecommunication, involving the manipulation and analysis of signals to transmit information. The simplex number system can enhance digital signal processing DSP, algorithms by providing a more intuitive representation of complex signals. This can lead to more efficient filtering, modulation, and demodulation techniques, improving the quality and reliability of communication systems. Channel coding techniques, such as error-correcting codes, are crucial for maintaining the integrity of transmitted data. The hierarchical and logarithmic structure of the simplex number system can improve the design of these codes, making them more efficient at detecting and correcting errors. This can enhance the performance of communication channels, particularly in noisy environments. Modulation schemes, such as quadrature amplitude modulation, QAM, and phase shift king, PSK, rely on complex number operations to encode data onto carrier waves. The simplex number system can introduce new modulation techniques that leverage its unique properties, potentially increasing the data throughput and robustness of communication systems. Telecommunication networks rely on complex algorithms to manage data traffic, allocate resources, and optimize performance. The simplex number system can enhance these algorithms, leading to more efficient network management and improved quality of service QoS. This can result in faster data transfer rates, reduced latency, and better overall network performance. Multiple Input Multiple Output MIMO, and Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing OFDM, are key technologies in modern wireless communication systems, including 4G and 5G networks. These technologies rely on complex number operations for signal processing and channel estimation. The simplex number system can optimize these processes, improving the performance and capacity of wireless networks. The simplex number system offers a transformative approach to handling complex numbers, providing a more intuitive, robust, and efficient mathematical framework. In the fields of information technology and telecommunication, this system can significantly enhance data storage, computational algorithms, cryptography, signal processing, channel coding, modulation schemes, and network optimization. By adopting the simplex number system, we can unlock new possibilities and drive advancements that will shape the future of digital communication and technology. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to exploring the transformative potential of the simplex number system with you. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal number system, termed the simplex number system, provides a transformative mathematical framework. This system can significantly impact weather forecasting and climate control by enhancing data analysis, modeling, and prediction capabilities. Let's explore the potential applications of the simplex number system in these critical fields. Numerical weather prediction models rely on complex mathematical equations to simulate atmospheric conditions. The simplex number system can streamline these equations, making computations more efficient and accurate. This can lead to improved short-term and long-term weather forecasts, providing more reliable information for disaster preparedness and resource management. Data assimilation involves integrating observational data into weather models to improve their accuracy. The hierarchical and logarithmic structure of the simplex number system can enhance data assimilation techniques by providing a more precise representation of complex data sets. 
This can result in better initial conditions for weather models, leading to more accurate predictions. Climate models simulate the long-term behavior of the Earth's climate system. By incorporating the simplex number system, these models can better capture the intricate interactions between the atmosphere, oceans, and land surfaces. This can improve our understanding of climate change and its impacts, aiding in the development of effective mitigation and adaptation strategies. Remote sensing technologies, such as satellites and radar, generate vast amounts of data that need to be processed and analyzed. The simplex number system can optimize these processes, enabling more efficient extraction of meaningful information from raw data. This can enhance the accuracy and timeliness of weather forecasts and climate monitoring. Geoengineering involves deliberate interventions in the Earth's climate system to mitigate the effects of climate change. The simplex number system can provide more accurate and reliable models for evaluating the potential impacts of geoengineering techniques, such as solar radiation management and carbon dioxide removal. This can inform decision-making and policy development in this controversial field. Effective climate control requires continuous monitoring of environmental variables, such as greenhouse gas concentrations, temperature, and humidity. The simplex number system can improve the analysis of environmental data, providing more detailed and accurate information on the state of the climate. This can support efforts to manage and control climate-related phenomena. Long-term climate predictions are essential for understanding future climate scenarios and planning mitigation strategies. The simplex number system can enhance the performance of climate prediction models by providing a more robust mathematical foundation. This can lead to more reliable projections of climate change impacts, supporting global efforts to address this critical issue. Effective climate control requires optimal management of natural resources, such as water and energy. The simplex number system can enhance resource management algorithms by providing more accurate and efficient models. This can support sustainable practices and improve resilience to climate-related challenges, such as droughts and extreme weather events. The simplex number system offers a revolutionary approach to handling complex numbers, providing a more intuitive, robust, and efficient mathematical framework. In the fields of weather forecasting and climate control, this system can significantly enhance data analysis, numerical weather prediction, climate modeling, remote sensing data processing, geoengineering models, environmental monitoring, climate prediction models, and resource management. By adopting the simplex number system, we can unlock new possibilities and drive advancements that will improve our ability to predict, monitor, and manage the impacts of weather and climate. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to exploring the transformative potential of the simplex number system with you. A type 2 civilization, according to the Kardashev scale, is a society that has harnessed the full energy potential of its star. Achieving this level of advancement requires groundbreaking technological innovations, efficient energy management, and robust infrastructure. The integration of complex numbers with the decimal system, termed the simplex number system, can play a pivotal role in this journey. Here, we explore how the simplex number system can contribute to humanity's progression towards becoming a type 2 civilization. The construction of a Dyson sphere, a hypothetical megastructure that encompasses a star to capture its energy, requires advanced engineering and precise calculations. The simplex number system can streamline the complex computations involved in designing and constructing such structures. By enhancing the accuracy and efficiency of these models, we can optimize the materials and techniques used, making the concept of harvesting stellar energy more feasible. Storing the immense energy harvested from a star demands advanced energy storage solutions. The simplex number system can improve the design and efficiency of these storage systems by providing more accurate models for energy conversion and storage dynamics. This can lead to the development of high-capacity, durable energy storage technologies that can sustain a Type II civilization's energy needs. Accurate navigation through space is crucial for interstellar travel and colonization. The simplex number system can enhance astrodynamics models, making it easier to calculate trajectories, optimize fuel usage, and predict gravitational influences. This can improve the safety and efficiency of long-duration space missions, facilitating the exploration and colonization of other star systems. Terraforming, the process of modifying a planet's environment to make it habitable, requires precise control over various environmental factors. The simplex number system can enhance the models used for simulating atmospheric, geological, and hydrological processes. 
This can lead to more effective strategies for transforming hostile planetary environments into habitable ones, paving the way for human colonies beyond Earth. Quantum computing is essential for processing the vast amounts of data and solving the complex problems associated with a Type II civilization. The simplex number system can optimize quantum algorithms and error correction techniques, enhancing the performance and reliability of quantum computers. This can accelerate technological advancements and enable new breakthroughs in various scientific fields. AI plays a critical role in managing the sophisticated infrastructure and technologies of a Type II civilization. By improving the efficiency of AI algorithms and data analysis techniques, the simplex number system can enhance the capabilities of AI systems. This can lead to more intelligent and autonomous systems for managing resources, conducting scientific research, and ensuring societal stability. Effective communication across vast interstellar distances requires advanced signal processing and data transmission techniques. The simplex number system can optimize these processes, making it possible to maintain high-bandwidth, low-latency communication networks between distant star systems. This can ensure seamless information exchange and coordination among different parts of a Type II civilization. Managing the massive amounts of data generated by a Type II civilization necessitates efficient data processing and analysis. The simplex number system can enhance data compression, storage, and retrieval techniques, making it easier to handle and interpret large datasets. This can improve decision-making processes and support the continuous advancement of technology and knowledge. Efficient utilization of planetary resources is crucial for sustaining a Type II civilization. The simplex number system can improve models for resource extraction, processing, and distribution, ensuring optimal use of available materials. This can reduce waste, minimize environmental impact, and support sustainable development practices. Maintaining the balance of biospheres on multiple planets requires sophisticated ecological models. The simplex number system can enhance our understanding of complex ecological interactions, leading to better management of planetary ecosystems. This can ensure the long-term sustainability and health of habitats within a Type II civilization. The simplex number system offers a transformative approach to handling complex mathematical problems, providing a more intuitive, robust, and efficient framework. In the quest to become a Type II civilization, this system can significantly enhance energy management, space exploration, advanced technologies, communication networks, and sustainable resource management. By adopting the simplex number system, humanity can unlock new possibilities and drive the advancements necessary to achieve a Type II civilization, harnessing the full energy potential of our star and ensuring our long-term survival and prosperity.